Hello, everybody. My name is Gilda Ross, and I'm the Glenbard Student and Community Projects Coordinator. This is the final program of the school year, and I want to thank all of you who gave us the generosity of your time. I want to thank our sponsors. You just saw the slide. Without them, it wouldn't be possible. Our annual sponsors, once again, the Emmy Gaffey Foundation, the DuPage County Health Department uh, Prevention Leadership Team, the Birth to Five Coalition from District 93, DuPage Medical Group, now Dooley, Case the Special Ed Cooperative, the Goodman, Sabrin Goodman Foundation of, of Lillian and Larry Goodman, Kids Matter, Glenbard Early Childhood Collaborative, Kiwanis, the College of DuPage, more partners and sponsors on the back of the brochure. You just saw that slide. Again, we couldn't do this without them. They have helped us organize a series next year. that will be coming to you every single week. So go to the website. Uh, we also have um, a slide that is going to showcase some of the upcoming books that um, we're asking you to take a look at and then to come back and meet um, with the authors. This is our summer reading. You can see some of the highlights. Dan Pink, Andrew Solomon, uh, Susan Kane, uh, Kelly McGonigal, The Joy of Movement. You'll see programs for young parents. You'll see programs for um, elementary first phone. Uh, you'll see some books are by alum, Big Feelings is a book by uh, one of our alums at Glenbard. Um, programs on how to raise an adult, how to raise a child. Um, we'll be looking at lots of programming on substance misuse. Um, so take a look at the website, check out the dates, uh, check out the readings at your library and be sure to come back. And please do share this resource. As you know, the Glenbard Parent Series is for everyone, anywhere. And um, if you're a social media person, please like us on Facebook um, and all the other options for media. For media. So excited about Grown and Flown. I think the minute this book came out, uh, this was at the top of my wish list to bring these important authors to us. And so finally, here we are, Grown and Flown, how to support your teen, stay close as a family, and raise independent adults. If you have a question, please enter it in the Q&A and the chat. Uh, because of the generosity of our speakers, this will be available later on the Glenbard Parent Series YouTube channel. We'll be hearing from a couple of questions. We'll hear questions from a few students. Um, and again, let us know um, what's on your mind. And I know we're in for a very exciting evening and um, couldn't be more looking forward to tonight. The speakers, the authors of this important book, Lisa Heffernan and Mary Del Harrington, the co-founders co of Grown and Flown are writers, moms and friends. They created Grown and Flown when each of their youngest kids was in high school and their oldest kids were in college. It has become the number one site for parents and teens and college students, reaching millions of parents every month. In their past incarnations, Mary Dale worked in television and media, and Lisa had a career that included Wall Street, politics, and writing. Lisa is a New York Times bestselling author whose books include Goldman Sachs, The Culture of Success. They both live with their husbands in New York, area where they raise their families, and there are many fans that are waiting to hear from our authors tonight. So ladies, take it away. Hello, good evening. Um, I am Mary Dell Harrington, and I'm here with my friend and co-founder Lisa Heffernan. We are so honored to be welcomed into your community tonight and to be part of this incredible Glenbard Parents Series. We want to say a especially huge thank you to Gilda Ross for inviting us and acknowledge her amazing leadership um, over so many years in putting this series together. We are very grateful to her and also to you for joining us tonight. So thank you. Thank you so much for carving out some time in your busy lives. And we know as parents, you are very busy. So Lisa and I are the moms of five young adults and our two families. I have a son and a daughter and Lisa has three fabulous boys. And we started Grown and Flown because our own kids were moving through the high school to the college years. And we were faced with new parenting challenges that we really weren't equipped to deal with. We ourselves are not parenting experts. You heard a little bit about our backgrounds from Gilda. We're obviously not doctors or teachers or mental health professionals. Before we started Grown and Flown, we really didn't know much more about parenting teens than what we had learned just 
in the, on the job, on the job training, I guess you could say. Um, we had really, you know, we had read, as many of you probably did when your kids were little, what to expect when you're expecting and had sort of winged it from there. We began our book, Grown and Flown, How to Support Your Team, Stay Close as a Family and Raise Independent Adults with stories that show how we are two highly fallible moms with highly imperfect families. We talk about the times when we let ourselves and our kids down, frankly, with our parenting. I talk about losing the plot with my son over an unusual and particularly unattractive haircut, forgetting for a moment that the very first rule of raising teens is it's only hair. And Lisa talks about the time her family was forced to leave a restaurant because of the damage her sons did there. When you have three boys, the thought of them fighting in a restaurant to the point of tipping over an entire table with all the plates, glasses, hamburgers that had just arrived, and even the centerpiece is an undesirable, but as she puts it, certainly not an imaginable possibility. So let's just say that for both of us, these were not shining moments in our two households. But we begin the book with these stories of epically bad parenting right in the introduction up front where the pages are still numbered with Roman numerals. We don't even want you to get to chapter one and think that we are not fully aware of the huge challenge in raising teens. We want you to know that we have lived this, this stage of life. So you may wonder why you're here listening to us talk about raising teens when so far all we've really talked about are our imperfections in parenting. The reason is because for the last decade, we've been listening to hundreds of thousands of parents of teens and young adults talk about what concerns them, what scares them, what makes them happy, and what inspires them. Lisa and I lead an online, online community of over 230,000 parents. And I hope that some of you are members. Um, if we were all together, we would ask you to raise your hands if you're part of the Grown and Flown Parents Facebook group. If you're not currently, we would certainly love for you to join us. And there's a button it, to raise their hands just below us, it looks like. So go ahead and raise your hand if you're a member of Grown and Flown Parents. <laughs> that good idea. Anyway, we also reach millions of readers through our website every month. So we have had our ear to the ground and it has honestly humbled us in our approach to parenting. We know that these are some of the loneliness, loneliest, most challenging, confusing, and yet consequential years of parenting, and they largely go unnoticed. Those challenges certainly existed well before the pandemic, but these last two years have only made your jobs as parents of teens excruciatingly difficult, and we know how hard this has been. Lisa and I have learned much from the 750 experts and writers who have shared their stories on the Grown and Flown website and their insight from both their family and professional lives. Many of the people who write for us are these amazing professionals who are also parents of teens, so they've been able to approach the work that they do and the writing that they share with us from the point of view of a parent as well as a professional. So while Lisa and I have been experiencing our own grown and flown years with our teens, we started at our website, we started an online community that we mentioned, we published the book, and we've recently begun a college admissions membership as we know how, how stressful college admissions can be, which is something we're going to talk about a little later. But the one thing that transcends all of these different platforms and projects and the work that we do is that we try very hard to take the stress level down in parenting teens in all of these different venues. We couldn't find personally what we needed when our kids were much younger, and we hope that we have built it in a way that can help you. Thanks, Mary Dell, for the introduction. Um, tonight, we want to talk about some of the challenges teens face on the road to adulthood. And many of these challenges have always been there for us, but they have certainly accelerated by the event, been accelerated by the events of the last two years. So we're gonna to touch on some of the ways as parents, we can help our teens through the stress that they face. So there is no topic that we hear more about from parents than stress. And we're gonna offer you some tips on ways to take down the stress in your homes and take down the temperature in the college admissions process, one of the bigger stressors for teens today. But most of what we hope to offer you 
is relevant no matter what the next step is for your child, whether your child is hoping to go to a two-year college, a four-year college, join the military or go straight to the workplace. We hope that the sorts of things that we're talking about tonight are very useful for families, no matter what their child's journey is going to, where it's gonna take them. So I wanna just begin by recognizing a few things. As parents, you have been through some difficult times for which there was no roadmap. I am not telling you something you don't know. You tried to support your team while they didn't have the support of the social and educational environment that they needed. It has been a monumental task. And if you have a stressed or anxious teen at home, you are living in all too common situation. This doesn't make it any better, I know, but parents should not feel alone in this. So let's look for a moment at what we know. The Atlantic reported, the Atlantic Magazine reported this week that from 2009 to 2021, the share of American high school students who say they feel, and their words are persistent feelings of sadness or hopelessness. That number of students rose from 22, 26%, I'm sorry, to 44%, according to a new CDC study that's just come out. So this is the highest level of teenage sadness ever reported. And while this trend began before the pandemic, the last two years have been a terrible acceleration in the number of teens who are feeling stressed, anxious or depressed. And I think we should just pause for a second, just for a moment to acknowledge that almost half of our teens are experiencing deeply uncomfortable feelings that in some way are impacting their ability to function in their daily lives. So this isn't, this isn't an oddity, this isn't unusual, this is now becoming what is the norm for many, many, many teenagers. And it's happening in every demographic of teens. It's happening in both genders. It's happening in all genders. It's happening from teens from all over the country. Not, it's not an urban problem or a rural problem. It, we're seeing it everywhere for teenagers. We're also seeing that the mental health problems among the young are rising much faster than for any other age group. So um, they're really suffering more than, than people who are older than they are. Dr. Candice Og Ogders, I say that right, Augers, who's a psychologist at the University of California, Irvine, um, explained it this way. And I just want to give you a brief quote that I thought was very useful. She says, young people are more educated, less likely to get pregnant, less likely to use drugs, less likely to die of an accident or injury. So by many markers, <clears throat> the normally measured teenage behavior by kids are doing fantastic and thriving. But there are these really important trends in anxiety, depression, and suicide that stop us in our tracks. So we wanted to start by saying, we know that some of the problems that around stress and depression and anxiety are real and they're growing and they're impacting all of our lives. But, and we're gonna talk about some, what we hope are some constructive ways that you can approach them with your teenager. But we also just wanted to give sort of a little ray of good news here, which is that teenagers now are drinking less, they are using drugs less, they are smoking less, and they are less likely to engage in riskier behaviors. So there is that sort of bit of good news that we wanted to bring to you before we talk about, go further about stress. So when, when we were writing our book, we were looking for, as Lisa said, constructive ways and suggestions we could offer parents to help their teens with stress. And one of the, um, one of the great things about living in New York is that you get to meet you know, wonderful professors. And one of those people we met was Dr. Alan Schlechter, a child and adolescent psychiatrist who happens to also teach a wildly popular class at NYU called the Science of Happiness. So we were able to sit down with him. And, oh, and by the way, we're gonna mention the, um, the names of many books that we um, love and authors we've interviewed and worked with, and many who have written for the book. So you may want to make notes of some of some of the titles that we talk about. And the first one is his book. It's called You Thrive, How to Succeed in College and Life. And it's a great read for a teen who's getting ready to go to college. Now in it, he talks about some pre-pandemic figures that say that 85%, 85% of college students feel stressed every day at some point. And 60% say, they are so stressed they could not do their coursework. Just sort of big numbers, and that's before the pandemic. But he suggests that there are two crucial things that we think about and that are really important as we try to help our teens think about and manage their own stress. Now, Dr. Selector has worked with teens for decades, and he has an important thing to say, which is we need to teach our kids that stress is not the enemy. Many teens get the message that stress is bad, all stress is bad, 
And if they're feeling stress, they need to make it stop. But he suggests that what we need to do is re-examine how we think and talk about stress. Because he, it, it's important to note, and he points this out, that stress is what challenges us and makes us strive. It's what we feel when we take on something new or something that's harder than we've ever tried before. Stress is, an, is how we grow. It's how we do things we haven't ever done before. So in the right context, it's a good thing, not a bad thing. As an analogy, we have to stress our bodies to get stronger or faster, but our teens, our pre, our, um, Preteens, our teens, our high school kids, our college kids, our young adults are in such a stage of their life of dramatic growth that of course they're feeling stress because every day they are probably trying something new and different, not only academically, but with their extracurriculars, with their sports, with their friendship groups. It's all very, very dynamic in their lives. So of course, a lot of the stress they're feeling is just organic with the, and, and, and goes along with the territory for this age group. But many of our kids have absorbed the message that stress is bad, all stress is bad, and, and nothing really could be further than the truth. So he makes a strong point. This is the first thing we need to teach our teens is to reframe the way they see stress and help them differentiate between good stress that's, that's positive for them and bad stress, meaning more than they can really manage. We need to teach them this optimal level of stress, how to recognize the optimal level of stress. During the last two, ye two years, many teens have felt far too much stress. And when that happens, they feel overwhelmed. We feel overwhelmed. We know, we know that feeling too, and we're stressed out and it's just, it's too much for us. We can't cope with that. But with too little stress, we really don't learn and grow. So our goal as parents is not to eliminate the stress or try to eliminate the stress from our teens' lives, but is to reframe it for them and show our kids the value of finding an optimal stress level for themselves. And for each person, of course, that's, that's going to be quite different. What they need to learn is that level that leaves them tackling a new challenge, but not feeling overwhelmed. It's not a quick lesson. This is something that is the, many conversations, not just one. Yeah, it's, it's important that we try and help them learn that about themselves, really, um, and we can act as their guides. So we want to go over some of the most valuable things we can offer our kids in ways that they can learn to personally manage stress. And we want to touch on ways that we feel that we can really guide them and, and act as an example for them. So the first thing we want to talk about is helping our teens understand ways that helps them to de-stress. Now for every person, this is different. You know, this as an adult, you know, some of us exercise distresses us. Some of us sitting down quietly with a book distresses us. Some of us half hour of junk TV is just the de-stressor we need. Our teens don't always recognize what it is for them that acts as a de-stressor. Again, it could be music, it could be seeing a friend, bit of mindless TV, exercise. They might not see the source of distraction and relaxation that really takes their own temperature down and helps them a bit. So we can help them by pointing it out to them, saying things, you know, I notice when you come home from school and you grab a book and a snack and you sit quietly in the corner for, uh, for a while, the whole day seems to fade away. Or when you pick up your guitar for a little while, I see you, I can just see, you know, the, your shoulders relax. I can see the smile back on your face. Um, so as long as what they're choosing to use as a de-stressor is not drugs, it is not alcohol, it is not a destructive behavior, we want to urge them and encourage them to go to that thing. Um, and we want to not stand in judgment of it. As Mary Dell said, we're not shy about talking about some of our bad parenting. One of my sons would often come home from school and play video games. And I am not a big fan of that. And I would um, give him a lot of um, hard time about that, I would say. I would urge him to get off the computer, get to work. You're not managing your time. This is a problem. You've got to stop playing computer games, computer games, video games. What I couldn't see that was for him a half hour, 45 minutes of doing that after a long day of school and then sports and then you know, the rush of a family dinner and ev everybody trying to get everything done that needed to be done. That was his way of just taking it all down for a minute before he began whatever he needed to do in the way of schoolwork in the evening. So I think it's really important that we look on without judgmental eyes at what's working for them. And if it's a half hour of, you know, I know Lisa Demore sometimes mentions kids watching cartoons for a half hour, even though they're 17 years old. 
doesn't matter. As long as it's working for them and bringing them back to that place and that feeling of calm. Um, the postscript on this is that that son went on to major in computer science and now works in the video gaming industry. So I'm the first to admit that I had no idea what was going on there. <laughs> Another thing we need to make sure is that our home is a refuge for them. When we were teenagers and we left school and we went home, it was peace and quiet. Maybe you fought with your siblings, maybe you fought with your parents, but by and large, our homes were a respite from whatever went on in our day in school. Our kids don't have that luxury. The social media means there is no escape. They face the judgment of their peers when they're home and their teachers are still there in terms of online grades and online assignments. Their friends are on Instagram. Their exposure to the things that stress them in the outside world do, does not end when they get into our home. So the, to the extent that it's possible and that we can make our homes as much of a judgment-free zone as much as a stress-free zone as we can for them, we're really helping them in terms of facing the outside world and the stresses they may find there. Next one, exercise and sleep. All too often, exercise and sleep are the first things to go when a student or, or a young person feels that they don't have enough time, that they're overburdened, that their schedules are overloaded. Out goes sleep as they stay up till midnight trying to get everything done. Out goes exercise because that takes a half hour, 45 minutes, an hour. Scientists and doctors all tell us the same thing. Sleep and exercise are crucial to dealing with stress. We know that as adults. And the best thing we can probably do here is to model it, to make sure that they see us making enough time for sleep and that they see us making enough time for exercise. And that we, we remind them that we know these two things are beneficial for their bodies and for their minds. The next way we think we can help our kids with stress is just by doing some of the little things. So stress kids often need help. We're asking them often to do more than we used to do in any given day in terms of the workload that they're facing at school, the amount of activities they do afterwards. It's a lot and it contributes to their stress. So if on occasion we can do a load of laundry for them that they should have been doing themselves or pack the lunch for them to take to school that they were supposed to pack themselves, we're not overparenting them. We're not disabling them from becoming adults. We're not getting in the way of their independence. What we're doing is showing them that what we do with people that we love in our families, we're there to support and love and care for each other and do those small things for each other that make our lives that little bit easier. So a lot of times um, the message that we get from parenting experts, which we take a little bit of issue with, is don't do things for them they can do for themselves. But when you have a stressed teenager doing some small things for them to make their day that little bit easier to make them feel cared for and loved is not disabling them from becoming an independent adult. The last one I wanna to touch on is so important and may in many ways be the most important and the biggest gift that we can give them. And that is teaching them about time management. Many of the stressful feelings our kids have is because they are unable to plan for their time in the way an adult plans for their time. And as Mary Dell said, we're gonna mention lots of books. One of the books that we love is a book by Dr. Frances Jensen. She wrote a book called The Teenage Brain. Do I have that right, Mary Dell? The, the Teen Brain. The Teen Brain. Okay, she wrote yeah. a book called The Teen Brain. Dr. Frances Jensen, she's a neuroscientist, a neuroscientist doctor at um, the University of Pennsylvania. And she writes a wonderful book about what our kids' brains can and cannot do at various ages. I think Karen Anderson may have talked to you all about this, uh, Kara's a pediatrician. But one of the difficulties that they often have is planning and thinking in advance and making allowances for what they're gonna need to do when. Teaching them those planning skills is the gift of a lifetime and reduces their stress. There is nothing more stressful than feeling like you have too much time to do something and not enough time to do it. That stresses me out just thinking about it. <laughs> it does me too. Doesn't it? It stresses yeah. them out as well. Yes. If we can teach them by using a digital planner, their, the calendar in their phone, so often we're seeing more and more that um, young people like to use these paper planners. They're sort of making a comeback. Um, sometimes some of them are beautiful. Some of them give you, you know, motivational sayings in them, that sort of thing. Or what I did with one of my kids is I put a huge whiteboard, um, you know, the ones you write on with markers, on his bedroom wall and he would write down his assignments and he would write down when they were due and we would look at the calendar together and he found that a useful way to plan his time. 
So if we can help our teens both by modeling with them and showing them the tools that we use to manage our time, that will both help them with stress when they're in their high school years, but it will also be a gift that will go on throughout no matter what they do after they finish high school. I think there are a couple of other things that I know we're, we're probably giving you many, 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 maybe many more ideas than you were expecting, but not all of these will work for each family. So hopefully you can pick and choose and, and see what you think really resonates and would work with your team. But one of the things that um, I think we're all aware of is how much stress comes into our homes from the outside and comes into our teenagers' lives from other people and, and, and social media. Um, Lisa had said earlier that the make, you know, think about how your house should be a refuge. And I think, you know, that's um, unbelievably important, but it's also important to make sure your, your kids understand that a lot of the stress they may be feeling is from peers or teachers or coaches. It may be coming from the expe expectations that teens feel that others have for them. You know, we can help them refocus on what their expectations are for themselves and encourage them to tune out the demands that may not be realistic or even really what they want. Research shows that girls in particular can be pleasers and can lose sight of what matters the most to them in trying to please other people. So making them mindful of this, making, you know, talking about this and, and trying to tease out whether they're feeling, you know, particular pressure from a coach or expectation academically that just really isn't as relevant to them as, as it might be is something that could really help. There's another thing that you should watch for, which is, which is find out if they're ruminating. So rumination is defined as the repetitive thinking about the causes and consequences of a problem instead of a solution. It's sort of going over the same thing over and over again in your mind without really moving forward. And unfortunately- Your mind gets on a hamster wheel, isn't it? Yeah, that's a really good visual image. And I think it's something that probably everybody who is here tonight can appreciate because how many times have we had that 2 a.m., 3 a.m. hamster wheel going and by the time you wake up, the solution is maybe pretty obvious, but in the middle of the night, you know, your mind is just ruminating almost and you can't really do anything about it because you have to get out of that. You have to break out of that. And unfortunately, rumination is associated with anxiety and depression and also a decrease in problem solving. So it's really, it's really easy to get caught in the hamster wheel in our minds and um, hard to move forward. But if you can talk to your teen about whatever stressful situation they seem to be caught in, and you may be able to point out, or they may be able to see for themselves that they're ruminating on a problem rather than moving forward and seeking a solution. We would never advocate solving a problem for them. We get this, this question quite often. How do you know if you're doing too much or too little? And, but we would always say, be there as a sounding board, always say, be there to help them brainstorm ideas. It's what you would do with a work colleague or what you would do with your partner is to help brainstorm and creatively solve. One thing you really also wanna do is celebrate their efforts. We can reduce stress by focusing less on outcome and more on effort. You know, we acknowledge when your team has worked hard, even if the academic outlet outcome or the um, athletic outcome is, isn't exactly what they would have hoped for, but focus, focus on the effort. And one other thing that we think is super important is to be a place for their emotional trash. Now, we did not coin that phrase, but Dr. Lisa Demore, who you all may be familiar with as she's spoken to your group, has said that psychologists have long observed that teenagers sometimes manage uncomfortable feelings by passing those feelings off to parents. So be their safe place, lighten their load when they pass their problems on to you. I'm sure you've had this experience where your teen comes to you and talks on and on about a problem that they're having. It's clear they've been thinking about it and they're very upset about it, yet we don't really know what they're asking us to do. We feel it can be very perplexing. You know, you haven't really done anything for your teen except just be there and listen. But somehow that was the solution, just to be there and to listen. Um, you can confirm this with your teen by simply asking, are you looking for help? Are you, do you want suggestions or you just need a moment to vent? So by the way, if you're not familiar with her books, Untangled and Under Pressure are two incredible books and we highly recommend them. And the very last thing about stress that we just want to mention, because for those of you who have teens who are going off to college in the fall, this is especially important. Um, you need to teach your teens 
when to seek help. Right now, if they're younger, um, certainly in the younger grades, they may look to you to determine whether they're sick enough to go to a doctor, or they may look to you to suggest, I think you need some tutoring. When they get to college, these are things that they will have to take on on their own. So it's important that they need to decide for themselves when to seek psychological services or when to seek tutoring. Teens who have not learned to assess their problems and then seek appropriate help may falter when they're faced with the in inevitable problems that almost every freshman will face of some sort or another. They're all gonna need some kind of help, but we can show them um, while they're still at home with you, um, how we ask others for help and suggest ways that they can seek the guidance of others. Yeah, and sometimes that stress is because they are trying to solve something themselves that they can't solve themselves, that they need help for, that they need to talk to a teacher, that they need help with a, from a classmate, um, that they need to talk to their guidance counselor. And in trying to solve something yourself when you really need the expert or the adult or somebody with more experience, um, you're never, the stress won't go away until you do do that. So that's why it's so important to teach them to seek out help when they need help and not try and take everything on themselves. So the last piece of stress we wanna talk about tonight is college admissions, because this is a particularly stressful moment in a lot of teenagers' lives. I remember my kids were hearing about college in ninth grade, and I was absolutely shocked about that. I don't think anybody when I was growing up talked about college until senior year. So we wanna drill down a little bit more and speak about college admissions and some of the ways we think that families can take the pressure of college admissions off their students. It's so important to do this. It, it can be a very, very wonderful bonding learning experience where your teen learns a lot about themselves and your family learns a lot about each other if you can keep the stress out of the process. Again, I know we've given you a lot of books, but we wanna give you two more. One is somebody who's also come to speak to your audience. It's Jeff Salingo's Who Gets In and Why. Jeff is a wonderful, wonderful um, expert in college admissions. He's also someone who very much believes in a common sense approach that keeps kids from feeling too much stress. The second book, which we absolutely love, and I urge you to look at the book and at the workbook. The workbook is for the teenagers. The book is for the parents and the teenagers. It's by the head of admissions at Georgia Tech. His name is Rick Clark. He wrote it with Brennan Barnard, who's a college admissions counselor at Derry Field. Do I have that right, Mary Jo? I think uh, so. And also- Derry Field uh, School in New Hampshire. Um, yeah. the, book, the book is called The Truth About College Admissions. <coughs> Pardon me. It's called The Truth About College Admissions. I think the book and the workbook are both excellent in helping guide your family through college admissions. So how can parents make the college admissions less stressful? First thing, don't talk, start talking about it too soon. Don't make high school about college. We have seen this happen too many times where for four years, parents are focused on getting their kids into college and they're focused on what they have to do to get into college and everything is talking about college. Don't take their high school years away from them. Don't make it a four-year process about getting into college. Your freshman, your sophomore, even the beginning of your junior year, your student needs to focus on their academics, their sports or their music or their theater or whatever activities they do. They need to focus on their job. They need to focus on their family responsibilities. They need to focus on whatever is important in their life that they do along with their academics. Um, and you know, so much changes anyways. We've seen parents jump the gun and start talking about college in ninth or 10th grade. Well, your ninth and 10th grader is gonna be a very different person by the time they're 17 years old. The one caveat to this is college admissions. Parents can do some early investigative work around colleges. This is one of the most expensive things any of our families ever pay for. So if parents want to start exploring the net price calculators that are on every college website to see what their family can afford. If they wanna start getting a realistic view on what their student may earn in merit aid or may be able to get in financial aid, parents can start that process, but they really shouldn't bring their children into it um, too early. Second and quickly, we, parents should not make the college conversation a constant conversation once it starts. So your 17 year old or your 18 year old does not wanna hear about college and talk about college all the time. Their life needs to be about more things than that. Experts tell us the most constructive thing we can do is perhaps pick out one day a week, let's say a Monday from 7 to 8 p.m., where maybe you explain to them some of the money things you've been investigating. They talk to you about the list that they're de developing or maybe some college admissions people who visited their, their high school that week and what they thought about what they were saying. Keep the college conversation 
in a narrow um, time window and don't let it take over everything else. Another important thing is to get out of the 1990s. Um, we all have lots of ideas about college that may be very outdated. Even our parents, their grandparents have even more outdated ideas. It's super important that you keep up with what's happening and things have been changing quickly since the pandemic. So we urge parents not to listen to the rumor bill, but to read experts on what they say about college admissions. Now, one of the ways to do this is to go to many of the college admissions professionals write blogs on the websites and the schools they work at. Um, three that we love and that we can suggest to you, the University of Illinois has a wonderful college admissions blog on the University of Illinois site. Georgia Tech has a fantastic one. University of Virginia has a fantastic one. Even if your student isn't applying to these schools, you can read thoughtful advice from people who actually admit kids to college every day, not the rumor mill from people whose kids went to college five years ago and may already be outdated. So now we're gonna to touch on four ways that parents can help. So as Lisa mentioned earlier, one of the most important things that you need to do, um, and you can do this well in advance of involving your student, is to think about how you're gonna pay for college. Every spring in our group, we hear parents who express this anguish at not being able to afford their teen's dream school that their child wants to attend. This is, we think, both heartbreaking and preventable. So we, when your teen begins to look at colleges and starts to make their list, make sure you've had these long in-depth conversations about what your family can afford and how you're going to pay for college. That's the benefit of you having done some legwork and research prior to them getting involved with you, you know, in the spring of junior year. For every family, this is going to be quite different, but there is much a 16 or 17 year old is going to need to learn about this major investment. So plan to have this conversation often um, to avoid the sort of disappointment at the end of the admission set, um, cycle. Be a second set of eyes. One thing that we both did with our teams was to help, was to create a spreadsheet that we could share the document with deadline dates. And this will be an evolving process, things that they can add to, um, to this document, things that you can point out, but it's really easy to miss deadline dates. Lisa missed, um, practically missed an art supplement with her oldest son. I did miss actually a deadline day with my daughter because it was a program within a college, within a university, and we didn't really know how to drill down. So it, these are quite easy things to do. And we so think, by, I think by creating this spreadsheet, you really help teach your kids unbelievable organizational skills, super, super point. important. Time management skills. It is so confusing because every college has different due dates for different things and it's impossible to keep up with them. So you're teaching them time management skills, you're teaching them organization skills, and you're, te you're teaching them how they frame a large complex decision-making process. So those are just great lifetime skills. And I think Lisa and I both are in the camp of, um, again, a lot of people say, it's your job, it's my team's job, go do it. But it's a hugely expensive and complicated job to just turn over to a 17 year old. It's a hugely expensive and complicated job for an adult to deal with too. There's a huge learning curve. And um, I, I would say be your team's partner. Don't dictate what schools they need to, you know, that they're gonna go to, but be their partner and, and another set of eyes. A third way that parents can be super helpful is to help your teen ignore toxic questions. How many times have you been at a family event or a neighborhood gathering, or perhaps just in the grocery store and everyone who hears that you have a junior or senior, everyone who, you know, everyone who goes up to a junior or senior in high school, the first thing they ask them is, is about college. Where are you going to college? Have you taken the SATs? How did you do? What are you thinking about a major? Just on and on and on inundated with questions and it's really, it's really um, invasive it's very invasive and i know it comes from a position of love and support in most cases especially from family and friends and people who've known your children since the moment they came home from the hospital quite likely but it's it's very helpful to um, practice with your team a polite way to make this to put a stop to this to these toxic questions you know, you, a good one to, um, to try out with your teen is to say, my parents and I have agreed to keep all of this private until my final decision. Um, the college admissions process is stressful enough without well-meaning adults making it tougher for your teens with all these questions. So come up with a buffer, help them buffer these toxic questions. 
The last thing is just be supportive. Um, one thing that we wanted, one person we wanted to quote who's who we love is Dr. Adam Weinberg, who's president of Denison University. And he's written about the concept of college fit in, in our book. He says that there are many good colleges in this country where you can get a great education, but if the fit is wrong, it's nearly impossible to get a great education, no matter how good the college is. So you, their parents, who know and love them better than anyone on the planet should be the supportive sounding board as they get closer and closer to identifying those colleges which are a good fit for them. So we hope this has been useful in talking about some of the ways to take stress down, teach our kids to manage stress. That's a lifelong gift we give them. Taking the stress out of the college process, again, incredibly, incredibly useful because it, it, it should be a joyous time for families. It should be a learning time and a, and a time where families really draw close. And, and it, it isn't always that, sadly. Um, we have spoken almost exclusively about the stress that teens feel, but we wanna just touch on the stress that maybe you might be feeling during this time. Um, Mary Dell and my kids all went to the same high school and we had a speaker come speak to us when our kids started 11th grade. And he said something that I've never forgotten, and it was really a gift. And he said to me, not to me, he said it to all the 11th grade parents, it's very important when your kids are going through the college process to pull apart the stress and discomfort you're feeling because the process is confusing and expensive, and there are a lot of real things to feel anxious about, and the pain and stress and anxiety you might be feeling because your kids are leaving. And it's very easy for us as parents to conflate these things. And I say this as a parent who did this herself. Um, your, your life is about to change. Your kid is leaving. Those feelings bring up a lot of, I don't know if we want to call it anxiety or discomfort or turmoil or some uncomfortable feelings. And it's very- Sadness, really like sadness, I think, yeah. for a lot of people. It's very easy to conflate that with the process of your kid getting ready for college. So- Again, there is very real anxiety about paying a staggering amount of money for our kids to play, um, to, for our kids to go to college. The admissions process can feel like a lottery. A lot of this can feel out of our control, but we shouldn't confuse these feelings with the impending changes in our family. Um, those are two different things, and sometimes it's hard to pull them apart. Um, so we just wanted to we just put that in your minds um, about how difficult it can be to put, to wrap our heads around that. So I hope that these suggestions have been useful on ways to help your kid with stress. Um, we leave you with an invitation to join our community if you're not already a member. It's called the Grown and Flown Parents Facebook group. It's an excellent place where parents exchange lots of ideas, lots of information. Um, they share problems sometimes anonymously if they need to because we very much believe in protecting the privacy of teenagers. Um, and they find other parents who understand exactly what they're going for going through, sorry. Um, we wanna finish by taking some of your questions and um, we hope this has been useful for you tonight. Thank you. Speaking on behalf of the many people listening in, extremely useful. Oh, thank, thank you, Gilda. So much. <laughs> you, know, you, you really, how lovely to be able to work with a friend the way you have made your career uh, work that way, how special, but you really do a wonderful job of distilling. There are, so, there are some wonderful experts out there and certainly in there's so much there's so much information to be had and you just do a lovely way of uh, sharing it with so many things uh, that I wrote down Lisa Demores be the place for their emotional trash that's so huge um, I love what you talked about destigmatizing the help that uh, someone suggested that um, that if, if you see any issues, have them see someone now in high school, because then when they go to college, it's just a normal part of what we, what we do. Um, ask, can I help you? Um, how, what do you want me to do here? Do you want me to solve it? Do you want me to listen? How can I best help? The modeling, the modeling, the modeling, the tone that we set in our home, so many important issues, so many important conversations, so many wonderful strategies and suggestions. I so appreciate it. Um, and I'm hearing people calling me and writing uh, an email. Okay, next, uh, we've, we've mentioned some of the books right there um, in our chat. Uh, and some of these people you can find on our Glenbard Parent Series YouTube channel um, where they have been with us. Okay, so first up, let's hear from some students. So Jane, you are up first.
Hi, I'm Jane. I'm a junior at Glenbard West. And I was wondering, um, as a junior, many of my friends are deep into the process of college planning. And I was wondering what suggestions you have for me to help my friends with their anxiety around college planning and what suggestions you have for us as we plan for this summer before senior year. Um, so Jane, that's a great question. The first thing I would say about um, helping people with their anxiety is just to, you, you know the kids who are a year ahead of you in college, in high school, sorry. You probably know some of the kids who are two years ahead of you. Many of them are probably siblings, um, older brothers and sisters. Remind everybody that people got to a good place. The fear is that you're, we're not gonna get into college, we're not gonna get into co any college you want to, or there isn't a college, or it's so hard to get into college. Just remind everybody and remind yourselves, and you can re self-reinforce this among yourself, that there were, most kids had a great outcome. Even when they, we, we hear this literally thousands of times, I'm gonna not even say hundreds of times, we hear this thousands of times. Kids went to a school that was their second choice or fifth choice, or wasn't even on their radar, as parents like to say, and then they loved it. They loved it. Not many kids actually transfer. So if you remind yourselves and remind each other that the outcomes are largely good, though they may be unexpected, um, I think that's really super helpful. The most I think I've, oh, sorry, Lisa, go ahead. Go ahead. The most useful thing I think you can do is look at your essay. If, I'm going to put aside the SAT and, and ACT thing because you, you all may have tackled that and it's, it's moving so much in so many schools you don't need it anymore for. But the most useful thing you can do over the summer is visit some campuses if you're able to do it. If that's too expensive, go online and watch all of the stuff that they prepared because the campuses were closed for so long. So a lot of that stuff that you used to have to go to campus for, you can now, the information sessions and tours, you can actually watch online and get your essays done. Writing college essays while you're trying to get the best grades you've ever gotten in some of the hardest classes you've ever taken, which is the fall of senior year, is a very tall order. So to the extent that you can get any of those essays prepared, outlined, brainstormed, whatever you can do to take that off your plate for the fall of senior year, you'll be doing yourself a favor. Those are, those are such great suggestions, Lisa. The, uh... The other thing you might want to do is there's a website called the College Essay Guy, and he has so many fantastic resources for students that are free that um, we can't think of a better person to recommend than, than Ethan Sawyer, who has created this, and he's helped thousands of families. So, um, Jane, that's, a, that's another good tip. And one other, I, another book, you may have heard us talk about the bookshelf of books that we love that we featured in our book. But Frank Bruni, who's currently a professor at Duke, wrote a book called Where You Go Is Not Who You'll Be. And this is a book that I think is great for students to read, as well as for parents, because it really does talk to what Lisa mentioned before about sometimes students end up at schools that are not, they, were, they weren't even on the map when they started looking, but then they fell in love with them and they, and they really thrived. So it's a, it's a quick read too. It's not, it's not like a big heavy book to read, and he's a fantastic, a fantastic writer. So I would, I would make that another suggestion. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks, Jane. Good luck. We had Frank Broody on his book tour. It's a wonderful book. Where you go does not define who you will be. If we yeah. just read that, right? We interviewed him for our book, and there's a section on um, what the message he'd like to give to parents. Mm -hmm. It's what you do when you get on campus that matters. Yeah, definitely. Okay, Naomi, you are up next. Hi. Um, my, my name is Naomi Friedman, and I'm a senior at Glenbard South High School. And as a senior, I have a lot of friends who seem very anxious about the transition from high school to college. And I was just wondering what suggestions you had about easing the anxiety of this transition. Um, I'll jump in first on that one. I think um, there's a longitudinal study, which we quote a number of times in our book. UCLA has been looking at the behavior of freshmen for 50 years. And um, it's fantastic data. I would not suggest you read it. It's very dense and very boring. This will not go on our reading list. But <clears throat> one of the things they found is that over 60% of students have some meaningful amount of homesickness. Yet what you hear is that most students feel like they're the only one who's homesick. So everybody's putting a really good face on it and everyone's acting like college is the most fun thing ever in the history of the world and everyone's having a great time. They love, 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 love their schools. Everything. 
except that 60% of kids are really feeling some reasonable amount of homesick at some point during their freshman year. So we need to normalize that as parents. We need to say to them, you're going to feel that. Call me, we'll talk or throw yourself into something, do whatever, you know, we'll, there's constructive ways to deal with homesickness. But you should feel that, that it's a normal thing, not an aberrant thing. It sh you should not feel that you're in the wrong place because you're deeply homesick. That does not mean you're in the wrong place. One of my sons um, describes his college as the best three and a half years of your life. Now, I don't think it's the best four years of your life, but his point was how can the first semester of college be the best time of your life when you have just left? everyone you have ever known and loved in the world, and your dog, and your bed, and your home. So we just need to take that, again, take our expectations down a little bit, saying college will be wonderful. It doesn't mean every day will be wonderful. It doesn't mean the first semester will be wonderful. And we should know that it's, it's very, very typical and normal to feel uncomfortable feelings while you're there. I think I think that I I've, I love that best three and a half years of your life. I've heard Lisa say that so many times, and I think that that really sums up a lot of how you can approach college, realizing that the first semester, it's going to be all so new that that there's a lot of that uncomfortable stress, but it also means you're growing and you're thriving. But the other thing um, that I think is really interesting, and this is another study that um, has been done that shows like the first six weeks of college there is a window of opportunity where people are all um, bent for acceptance of awkwardness. So much more accepting of somebody who comes down who's a perfect stranger to sit down with them at the dining hall or just introduce themselves because, and after that, that, that window closes a little bit. But so throw yourself into, and, and don't feel bad about behaving awkward. And in fact, that should sort of be your mantra. Be awkward and social and, and connect with people as much as you can because there's just this unique period right at the very beginning and you don't want to miss it. So um, go to school and be awkward. <laughs> Love that. Um, Shannon mentioned um, about, they, she loved the way your comment about not living in the 90s. Um, that is a great one. I starred that one. Um, it also reminds me about, I think it might have been Lisa Damore who talked about how um, we can talk to our kids about final exams, applying to college. We can talk to them about the dances, what it was like. We can't talk to them about this experience of the pandemic. This is not something that we experience. And to, as you just said, listen, be there, be, validate, uh, understand. Um, when you were interviewed on WGN the other day, you talked about um, that suggestion that you gave about making sure that you've done that communication with the college about having access to the information on your child. Would you talk about that, please? Do you want to? Yeah, no, Lisa, go ahead. Oh, um, that was um, basically some legal documents that um, parents can, might consider um, taking advantage of. So, and if you want, you can find them on our website. Um, there's a company that we really suggest called Mama Bear. Um, we have links on our website, but if you look up Mama Bear legal documents, the, the issue is that when our kids turn 18 years old, we have no access to their medical care. And we, we can't even talk to their doctors. And if something happens to them, they are not required nor are they even allowed to call us necessarily. So it's important that if your kid um, is, if you want, if there's any reason you need to have access to their medical information, or you think there's a chance that they will need you to make any decisions for them, um, or if you wanna see their grades, there's, there's separate forms for grades, we're not allowed to see their grades also. They need to sign documents and um, have them notarized. They can revoke this privilege at any point they want. So what might be useful for an 18 year old, you may not want for a 19 year or 20 year old. The reason why this is important, we think, particularly when they're 18, right up until their 18th birthday, they weren't allowed to make any medical decisions on their own. The doctor will not listen to them. You have to consent to all their treatment. They have one birthday one day and now you have nothing to do with it and your hands are completely off and it's all on them. That's a pretty quick transition for something that's pretty important like deciding on your, your own medical care. Um, I'll just give you an example because we've thrown out so many examples of our families. One of my kids got quite sick, nothing managed, something manageable um, freshman year, but the doctor wasn't really supposed to talk to me. And there were things I knew about his past that he didn't really know about. 
Um, he, he just didn't remember, you know, what the pediatrician had told me. So I needed the pediatrician, his doctor, sorry, at school to just be able to talk to me in just this one brief instance. We're not suggesting that you get involved in all of their medical care. This is when there's a situation of particular importance, an illness, an injury, something like that, where you may need to have some involvement. This would not be a day-to-day -day thing. And the, the other thing why it's so important to get this done now is because some of the documents need to be notarized and some of the documents can be different if your student is leaving you know, their home state and going to a different state, there's a level of complexity that is required. And you don't really want to have to go send documents back and forth that need to be notarized because that's going to flummox your first year student and just add some stress to their lives that's unnecessary. Um, we have an off to college checklist that includes links to this mama bear side and, and many other suggestions for the things that people aren't necessarily needing to buy because there's, you'll be inundated as the high school senior mom with all kinds of things to buy, dozens and dozens of things. What this is, is a list of things to do. And we're happy to forward that on to you, Gilda, if you want to share that with your, with your community, because it really, we, we asked our group of 230,000 parents to actually tell us what the things were that were the most important to them. So these are legal issues, medical, finance, you know, really pretty high level things that you may not think about when you're so wrapped up thinking about what comfort or where we'll work and twin Excel sheets and things that net net are a little bit less important. We'll put that information on your page on the website. Um, okay, and, great. Thank you. okay that, that would be great. Um, someone just asked a question. Um, they're past, um, they're, they're, they're looking for some takeaway, something that you did, didn't get a chance to get to. Uh, we're past the decision day. Um, can you tell me something in your wisdom that I need to know now? Honestly, that checklist um, has a lot of really great ideas and it is pretty granular, much more than we could cover in the three minutes that are remaining. Um, one thing that is that we will, two things that I'll say that add to that is do not overbuy your for your student um, getting ready for their dorm. That's another way that I think we sort of, it's sort of retail therapy. It makes us feel better because we're trying to make sure that our student has everything under the sun that they could possibly need because heaven forbid that they're, you know, you send them somewhere that they're not prepared, but don't overbuy and kind of make sure that you're not um, spending way too much money than, than you really need to. The other thing is think about a letter that you want to write to them and a letter that you want to leave for them in their freshman dorm that they can open after you leave. You'll, you'll want to spend some time telling them what's really essential to you that, that that you want to convey to them. So this is not something that you just dash off. It's not about separating whites from darks in the laundry. It's about your family values and about your hopes and dreams for them. It's a good exercise and, and something that will be very meaningful to them. Very good. So many people are commenting on their takeaway. Um, and, and I love this too, not making the four years of high school about college. Um, and, you know, we've heard it, you know, in, mid in middle school, you have too, it's all about preparing for high school. And, and really, um, it's just such a, just a blink of an eye, isn't it? But we're, we're also, we're stealing their teenage years from them when we do that. And, you know, we all have strong memories of high school. It's, it's, it looms large in our lives. They, high school needs to be about high school. Right. And I, I do, I know you go out on a limb when you say, it's okay to help your child during this time, pack a lunch, um, do the laundry. Um, I, I agree with you. I agree because the expectations now are not what they were. And maybe at one time, a young person could have all those, you know, and I'm, I'm thinking, you know, while they're young, while they're in the middle elementary, yes, perhaps do not do for your child what they can do for themselves. But in these years, in these, in these, this, these last few years of high school, whatever we can do nowadays. So uh, last question, what, what keeps you hopeful as you, as you think about, you know, the, the state of, uh, of all of this now, how do you stay hopeful? Oh, uh, you know what, I want to, I'll give you a small little story that happened in our group today. It was the most incredible thing. Um, we all know that it's very difficult to find housing, for instance, we have many young adults who are moving to cities where they've never lived. And it's, it's really tough to find an affordable house and whatnot. 
And one of the members of our group um, reached out and said, you know, my son's moving to a new city and, and doesn't know anybody, you know, does anybody have any tips for where they could find um, a place to live? So these, this mom reached out privately, turns out they had some things in common. She, you know, not only did she advise this son, this son of a stranger about where he could live eventually, but she actually let him stay at her home in the interim period before this apartment was ready. So what gives me great hope is kindness. Kindness between strangers, kindness between friends. There is an abundance of kindness. Mm -hmm. And as we, as we ourselves think about what we can do to help other people, we just add to that kindness factor. And, and our kids are really kind people too. Can I add one thing to that, Gilda? When our kids were little, I could not have gotten through the baby years, the toddler years, those years without the, the family, the friends that became family, the other parents who became the people I could talk to, the shoulders I could cry on, the community that I needed. As our kids become teenagers, there's less of that. There's less of it because we're all busier, we're working, our kids are running in 20 different directions. And it's harder to talk about their problems and our problems with them because of privacy and because the issues are bigger. The issue of your child drinking is a bigger issue than the issue of your child not you know, napping. We need the community, the friends and support even more when we're raising teenagers than we did when we had babies. It may seem like we need them when we were babies, we need them now even more. The issues are more complex, the consequences are more profound our needs as parents to have that community of other parents. So the kinds of things that you're doing are amazing the way you're creating community, but as parents, we should seek that out because we need it every bit as much. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's, that's great. Uh, makes up, thank you for the kind words. Um, I'm thinking about one of the programs next year with Madeline Levine, success is not a straight line. Um, and, and, and when you talked about kindness, it, it made me think about how important it is, as you just said, be vulnerable, share, um, be honest when your friend, uh, because it may be you with that challenging situation the very next day. And let's all try to be kinder to ourselves. Let's give ourselves as parents grace during this time. One parent said they're gonna, uh, they're gonna go forward um, and grade themselves pass fail from now on. I like and, that. Right, isn't that great? So much information, so important. I'm so grateful to you. Um, can't wait to have you back already. So <laughs> thank you both so much. Thank you, Gilda. Thank you all for your time tonight. Students, thank you as well. Everybody, please have a safe, safe summer and come back in August, okay? Take care, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Good night.